All you really need to do is be there. It's like, let's say it's really cold outside and you see a building and you know it's going to be warm inside. You go inside the building. You don't have to do anything to be warm, right? You just go inside. And the same thing when you're at one of these power places, you don't have to do anything there. It's when you like, if you have a wearing blender and you want your wearing blender to turn on or your lamp to turn on, all you got to do is plug it into the wall. And the same thing with the sacred site. Just go. You are plugged in. That's it. And if you have an intention, that predisposes you somewhat to a deeper connection. But really, the power of these places is so strong. Just go. All you got to do is be there. And then people say, what to do when you're there? And I go, well, it's, sometimes it's nice if you can take a nap. And in medi big medieval pilgrimage cathedrals, they got all these pews. You just lie down on, the, on it. And at a lot of places like Mayan tombs and Indian temples, if I can, I lie down and take a nap. And then I always try to do a meditation. And it really doesn't even matter what type of meditation you're doing. Again, it's just be there. You know, like Ram Dass used to say, be here now. Just be here now. That's it. Just be there. Welcome back to the Sounds of Sand podcast. My name is Michael Riley. Today I'm in conversation with Martin Gray, who is a seasoned explorer, photographer, and travel writer, renowned for his profound insights into pilgrimage and sacred sites around the planet. And he created the World Pilgrimage Guide in 1996, which is a website that's received more than 100 million visitors and shares lists of places, writings, and photos of the sacred sites that he's visited in over 160 countries. In 2004, National Geographic published the geography of religion of his photos. And in 2007, Sterling published the book Sacred Earth, a collection of 200 of his photographs. You can connect more with Martin at sacredsites.com. So let's get into it today on the Sounds of Sand podcast presented by Science and Non-Duality. Welcome to Science and Non-Duality. What is non-duality? The universal forces. It's the collective conscious being aware. Trauma is not the external event that happens. Trauma is the impact of that event, which is the disconnection from ourselves. That matter is energy. Energy is matter. That's what EMC squared is about. There's a language without nouns. There is a language without subjugation. There's a language without objectifying. But if it's recorded, then we there is a collapse. But if it's not, then it's the infinite potentiality. Welcome, Martin, to our Sounds of Sand podcast. Thanks for being here today. And thank you for inviting me. Hope we have fun here. Yeah. So I will, I will have uh, introduced you in the opening of the show and described your project a bit, this uh, immense and, and wonderful project and the World Pilgrimage Guide. Uh, but could you tell us a little bit of your background and how you became interested in sacred sites? Well, I think it really began with my parents. My father was a military attache. My parents both loved to travel. They met and were married in China. And then I was born in Colorado Springs. But when I was just about a year old, we went to Germany Stayed there for three years. I have very, very faint memories of Germany, none actually. And then when I was 12 years old, my father got stationed in New Delhi, India. My father's, ha let's say his hobby, he really knew nothing about it. He, was, he enjoyed archaeology and he enjoyed photography. And so even before we went, because we were living in New Mexico and I was exposed to archaeology there and photography there. And then when we got to India, my father gave me this uh, German camera called a Raleigh cord. Mm -hmm. And I just started taking pictures, really took to it. And India is such a fertile place to take photographs. And I didn't know anything about pilgrimage and sacred sites at that point, but I was fascinated with the temples. Mm -hmm. And my Mother trained me to travel, and then they let me go wherever I wanted. And I started traveling around India and Nepal on my own with my Raleigh cord camera and taking photographs. And one time I was at a shrine in Nepal in the, the city of Kathmandu called Swayambunath. And I'd gone there during the day with my mother. And then that night after dinner, um, I was, yeah, I think I was 12, 12 or 13 years old. 
I was 12 years old at that point, and I had a lot of youthful energy. And I went out of the hotel and I went back and climbed the stairs to Swayambunath Stupa. And it's also called the Monkey Temple because mm -hmm. there's hundreds and hundreds of monkeys that hang around the temple and they climb up on the temple during the day and at night. And so I went up there with them and I had this really profound experience which I didn't understand at that point. And I sort, I'd already been having what I call the re visionary experiences. I'd already been having, vi receiving visions since I was about six years old. And when I was at Swayambunath Stupa, I saw some pictures in my head of me as an older man. And I had this idea, this notion that one day I would like to make a photographic atlas of sacred sites of temples. I didn't even really think of them in that time as sacred sites, but of just temples in India, in Nepal, Buddhism and Hinduism. Mm -hmm. And um, then I kept traveling around India on my own. And the first place I went to that I really, well, not the first place, but a place that I went to that had a really tremendous effect upon me is called the Golden Temple in Amritsar in Northwestern India. And I took some pictures there and again, had some profound experiences and then we stayed in India for three and a half, four years, and I continued to go to a lot of these sacred sites, again, not knowing what I was doing, just enjoying the architecture and enjoying taking pictures. And I used to photograph Indian weddings, and there's an interesting story of how I did that. But because it was sort of novel having a small, as little short guy with the same sort of cameras that the Indian photographers would have, photographing Indian weddings, and then I'd go to the Inter American International School and develop the pictures – and then I would give them to these Indian people that I, I had met in when I was photographing their weddings. And I made enough money. And so I bought my first two Nikons. Mm -hmm. And then I just kind of never put them down. I've taken pictures now. So I'm 69 and I've been doing this for God. It's well over 50 years oh, cool. taking pictures. And of the sacred sites, 42 years. So that's sort of how I began before I began having the second set of visions that um, was in 1982. And so these early experiences, you know, 12 years old at these sacred sites, was it most visual things that you were seeing or were you kind of energetically feeling in your body like, okay, this, is, this place is important. I need to photograph this place. I would say a little of both. And I wasn't that tuned into what was going on. My first vision started to occur when I was six and seven years old, and I didn't really know what they were, but I saw these pictures of my of what I later understood were myself when I got to be an older man, in which I w had longer hair and I was an older man, and I was speaking in front of large groups of people saying things. And at the same time, I don't, I don't know if you remember this, but there was a time in American television years and years and years ago where, where if women did dishes, wash the dishes with detergent, the detergent dried their hands out. So there was the, the, the things called Playtex living gloves and where women were encouraged to put them on their hands to wash the dishes so they didn't dry out their skin. And I conceived of this notion that I would like to be a Playtex living glove on the hand of God and that I wanted to be a paintbrush in the hands of perfection. And so this notion was from me from a very, very, with me from a very, very young age. And then I had more of these experiences in India. And in India, you know, I don't know how much you know about Hinduism, but in Hinduism, they talk about there are four what are called yugas, great ages of time. And each yuga with a U has a particular yoga with an O. And we are now in the Kali Yuga, the age of darkness. And it is said the most appropriate yoga for this yuga is bhakti yoga or the yoga of devotion. And that's been something that has touched me for a long, 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 long time. And so in a sense, what I'm doing with all these travels to these 160 sacred sites and photographing them, it's an expression of devotion for me, an expression of devotion to divinity, to great spirit, to the earth and to the people. So I, that's how, what I conceive of, how I conceive of my work. And I never really thought of myself as a as of, uh, even, you know, this is interesting because when I first started going to these sacred sites in 1982, at that time I owned some travel aid. Well, I'd been, in, I'd been a, a, in an ashram for 10 years. And in there I was very devoted to this Indian guru. And then I left that ashram and I set up these travel companies. 
And I wasn't really happy. I had a nice girlfriend making a lot of money, but I didn't feel I was had any spiritual purpose. And then one night I had this really tremendous visionary experience that indicated I ought to go to Easter Island um, where I'd begin to find the answers to my prayers. That's what the, the this vision there is. I was actually at my apartment in Miami Beach, Florida. Well, in Miami, Florida at this point. And I saw this vision in my head of the stone heads at Easter Island. And I heard this these words and it said, go here and you will begin to find the answers to your prayers. And so I went to Easter Island in Machu Picchu and that was in 1982. And at both of those sites, I had more visions and in both of the sites, I saw this five-story wooden pagoda in Japan. I, it didn't say it was Japan. I just saw it, and I surmised. I thought, that's probably Japan. And I heard these, this voice, and it said, follow the pilgrimage routes of the ancient religions. Hmm, interesting. So I went back to Miami, and I told my business partner. And well, he first, he said, there's something happened to you over there. What is this? Tell me. So I told him, because I hadn't told him about the first vision. So I said, David, I think I got to go do this. And he said, I think you got to go do this too. Wait a few months because it's our busy season. We sold villa, rented villas in, in the Caribbean in Mexico. And so I started studying Jap Japanese at that point. And then I went up to the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And I knew nothing about how to do the research on this subject. But I thought, well, let's look in some architecture photography books and we'll maybe find the location, the names and the locations of certain temples in Japan. And so I did. And I found marked them on maps. And then I had a bicycle. I was a kind of a bike racer at that point. So I took a I had a bicycle made for me. This is before uh, mountain biking. I had a bicycle made for me. And I went to Japan. And that first trip, I spent six months riding around to a little bit of the third islands in Japan. And when I would go to these temples, and I would climb these sacred mountains. Again, I've been practicing meditation for 10 years, so I was moderately skilled at turning off the entire internal dialogue and perceiving something. And at these sacred mountains and at some of these Buddhist and Shinto temple complexes, I continued to have these visionary experiences. And then finally, after about six months, I was at this sh really important Shinto shrine in Japan, and I was thinking my business partner wanted me to come back to Japan to America and I was going to and I at there was this Shinto festival and the next morning after the festival I went up on top of this hill overlooking the temple and I was waiting for the sun to rise so I could get a good picture and I was just sitting there meditating and then I had this really tremendous visionary experience and in it I saw the earth rotating and my eyes are shut and I'm meditating and I'm seeing the earth rotating slowly and there's all these points of light on the surface of the earth. And it was given to me to understand that these points of light represented where power places, and that's what I was calling them at this point, power places were on the earth. And that if I wished, I wasn't told that I had to do this, but if I wished, I could go to these power places all over the planet earth. And I like that idea. I'm at 30 years old at this point, and I didn't really want to work in my travel agency. And I thought, wow, this is great. I would like to continue riding a bicycle around the planet, going to these stunningly beautiful places. So I went back to Miami and I told my business partner, I can't stay here. So I sold the company to him. And then I began, and the first place I went was to Mexico, and then I had my first big robbery there. They stole two cameras and seven lenses, and I went back to Miami, and my business partner, I hadn't sold the company to him yet, and he said, Martin, rather than going to Mexico, it's summer there, it's going to be really horrible, I just got some free tickets on Olympia Airways, you could go to, to Greece. So I thought, that's great. So I bought two more cameras and some more lenses. And I flew to, to Greece, and that was uh, I spent a little bit over a year riding the bicycle around 11 countries in Europe, visiting only this. The only thing I was visiting was the pilgrimage sites and reading some books and getting more of these visionary experiences and falling in love with what I was doing. And then I just continued. And now it's 42 years, 166 countries, and I've read in my library in there and with my iPhone, I could walk in there and show you, wow, you have a lot of books. I have about 
3,000 books in there, almost all of which I've read. And so in the process, I've become a real scholar of this subject, but I've never approached it from a scholarly vantage point like a lot of archaeologists and historians do. I came from a real spiritual vantage point and along the way thought, well, let me study the academics and the scholarly knowledge about the stuff. And though I'm highly educated on that at this point, I still don't consider myself a scholar. I consider myself a pilgrim Mm -hmm. who's read a lot of books. Mm -hmm. Nice. And when you were on your so you were traveling for uh, several years on your bike, photographing yeah. with all of your camera equipment too on the bike. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I so I did, I did, so I did that. I did Japan and Korea, and then Mexico, and then a lot of Europe, and and then that was it. So it was two and a half, three years I did by bicycle. And then I came to understand it's wonderful because you get good exercise and it's fun, but it's an incredibly inefficient way to move around. You got to carry all these cameras and you got your tent and your sleeping bag and, you you know, it's just it's inefficient. So I stopped doing that. And then for several, gosh, I bet you is 20 years, 25 years, I'd go by buses and trains. But then I came to see, well, that's inefficient, too, because some of these pilgrimage shrines, some of them are pretty remote and there's no way to get to them by local transportation. So then I'd have to get as close as I could by a bus or a train and then I'd rent taxis and hitchhike. And then when I started selling my photography um, and I started doing all these slideshows and I'd made some money, I started doing what I do now is I go into a country and it's actually the most efficient rent a car and then you're free. You can go where you want, when you want. And um, so the last, gosh, 20 years, I just drive everywhere. Yeah. But getting to the actual site, you know, I imagine there's something in the act of pilgrimage and that, that walking, you know, the kind of traveling by foot with the pilgrims to the specific site. Yeah. Well, so now that's interesting you bring that up because pilgrims in antiquity pilgrims had to walk and then when pilgrims you know i mean then when some people around the world developed the wheel but if you've got a wooden wheel on mud muddy ruts it's much more comfortable just to walk or maybe you get on the back of a mule or a burrow but a lot of times pilgrims just walked so I've walked between some of the sites, but a lot of times I get to them by other transportation. And then when I'm at the site, then I will walk around the site and there's a lot of pilgrims. And now at one of the things about pilgrimage sites is, oh, and this gets detailed and this gets complex and this gets to be a really big discussion. But there's different, oh, where, where, where to go with this one? First of all, there's three types of people that visit sacred sites. There are traditional religious pilgrims. Buddhists go to Buddhist sites, Hindus to Hindus, Christians to Christians. Then they'll have people that are on tour groups. So you'll get a bunch of Americans and they'll go over to England and they'll get a tour and the tour will take them by bus around London and then around the English countryside. And then everybody wants to go to Stonehenge. So they're taken to Stonehenge. And these people have no idea about archaeoastronomy or the ancient people that built Stonehenge. To them, it's just monumental architecture. Or you'll have people going to Peru and they'll see Machu Picchu or they'll go to Egypt and they'll be taken to the, the Great Pyramid and some places like this. So they're not really aware of why they're at these sacred sites or even if they are sacred sites, but they're there. And then they'll have people like me who feel a spiritual magnetism to these places. We're not people aren't religious pilgrims. They're not really interested in monumental architecture, but for years they have had a vision or an attraction to these places. And so they go to them. So there's those three types of pilgrims at the places. Um, so then we got to talk about, well, why are sacred sites where they are? And over years and years and years of visiting these places and reading about these places, I've come to understand that there's actually 32 different types. I've delineated 32 different types of these places. And then we have to ask the question, well, why are they sacred? What is the power? How do we account for that? 
And over years of reading and years of going to these places, I can actually discuss 20 different factors that contribute to the power of place. And I put them in four different categories. And to me, in one sense, well, you know, we can say there's the power of the earth. And there's certain places on the planet that for a variety of reasons have what we could call a geophysical energy, presence of underground water, presence of certain minerals. Um, And then there's certain places on the planet that somehow they have a resonance with different celestial bodies. And by that, there's four types, sun, moon, planets, and stars. And the people in antiquity recognized this. And so they would put their sacred sites, their structures, at places that had some sort of resonance. And then they would do the certain type of astronomy we call horizon astronomy. You know, nowadays people look through glasses, through lenses, and they look far off in the distance. But in antiquity, people would watch the rising and falling of different celestial objects on the horizon. And they would craft these stone rings, rings, not circles. 98% of them are rings, not circles. There's a few that are circles like Stonehenge, but most aren't. And they would use these devices as astronomical observation devices to predict in advance of their occurrence those days in the year or those days in the cycles, the celestial cycles of those objects, when the energy was going to be most strongly there. These are the origins of the earliest festivals. And then other religions or religions would come because all of this is pre-religious. And then the religions would come and they would take over. Different cultures would come and they would take over these sites. And then they would the religions would supplant them. They would start having religions there. And so then what you get a really good example is England, is, is Europe. You had these before the arrival of Christianity in the second to the 11th century. You had all of these sacred sites. And but they're, they're, there's no gods and goddesses. They're just power places. And then the Christians came and they didn't like this. And so what they did is they tore down a lot of the stone rings and the sto- other stone structures, broke up the stones and built churches or basilicas or cathedrals at them. And they put them there and then they dedicated them to Christ or Mary or different saints or different people. And they oftentimes had a, a, a festival day, which was the exact same day that the pagans had said was the holy day. Like so Christmas. what you see is – Yeah, you see this continuation of the usage of the site. To me, that's fantastic. And so then the fourth major and the most important really is human intention. And by this, you get a really good example of it with Sufi shrines, because you could have a Sufi sage and all he was was a, a teacher. And so People come, not even pilgrims, just people come from villages around the regional area because there's a sage that was thought to have wisdom. So people are coming for dozens of years and then the sage dies and then people are sad. So they bury the sage there and then people would come to the tomb of the sage. And so over hundreds and hundreds of years, more and more people come and the place becomes charged by human intention. And that's super, super important. It's what's happening here in Sedona. I, she's now passed away, but she was a friend of mine named Paige Bryant. And she came out with a book called Earth Changes Survival Handbook a bunch of years ago. And when she'd been here in the late 70s, there were no vortexes. There was no in American Indian presence here uh, in a sense of sanctity at all. But Paige channeled this being called Albion, and Albion told Sage that there were some vortex sites here. Paige put it in her book, and now it's become sort of an American mecca. All of these people come here, and they go to those particular vortex sites where there was nothing, but there now is something because so many people have gone to the sites. So sites can pre-exist, and then sites, power places, can be made by human intention.
Interesting. Yeah, that was actually going to be one of my questions was, was, do the energy of these places exist before people arrive there? And it sounds like it can be a, 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 yeah, a spectrum of, of the two. You got it. Spectrum. Very good. Very good way to put it. Yep. Yep. Um, so you have this uh, massive list on your website. I forget the exact number of, of sacred sites that are listed here. Have you been to all of these or are these all, these are also ones that you've read about and said, okay, this is a sacred site because of research I've done? Well, there's a section on the website, which is the, the map. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has hundreds, and it has, gosh, a few thousand points. I'd say yeah. of the ones that are on the map, 80 to 90% of them I've been to. Yeah. Yep. I've been to over 2000 sacred sites. Yeah. On a lot of the on then there's an index underneath the map that has all of these countries and it lists all of these sites. Mm-hmm. 80 90% of them I've been to. Some of those sites will be linked. And if you click on them, they'll go to a page or a gallery that has photographs of it and lots of them aren't linked. But yeah, I at this point it's about over 2000 of them, yes, that I've been to. Choosing of the sites, has that come through research or does some, some of them come about through word of mouth? Like you're at a place and they say, oh, you need to check out this uh, off the beaten path place no one knows about that's a sacred site. Virtually, I would say 99% is from research. And one of the things some friends of mine have noticed, because let's say we'll be at a restaurant and I'll hear somebody speaking with a certain accent, which I can usually understand and I'll go up to them. I, I inter- I like, I talk to people a lot. I like to introduce myself and I'll go up and I'll say, where are you from? And they'll tell me their country and I'll say, Oh, I've been there. And then we'll have a little conversation and they'll see, where have you been? And I'll start, I'll name some of these sites and invariably I, they'll say, Oh, you've been to more places in my country than me. So when I'm in Spain and India and Bolivia and Swaziland, wherever it is, because I have done so much prior research, I, by all these reading that I've done, I just know where all these sites are. And for years and years and years, when I read books, I keep a list, keep a list. And then when I finally, then I make maps. When I'm finally ready to go to that country, I put all these points on the maps. And then when I get to the country, you know, I'll come in through a major transportation juncture. Maybe it's by a boat port or maybe I'll fly in or maybe I'll come in by train or bus. And then Either I use buses and trains to go around or I rent a car. And then I just move around and try to get to 80, 90 percent of the places on my maps. Occasionally, somebody will tell me of a site that I hadn't known before. Um, And, you know, that's interesting you bring that question up because of something that I've just done. India is the country in the world I know best. I've been to India 16 times. And what I've been doing in India the last five trips, and this is just an analogy, you know, in like Hollywood, they have A-list actors and B-list that. So in India, over, let's say the first 10, 12 trips, I had gone to all the A-list pilgrimage shrines of Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, Sikhism, all the A-list. And then let's say six journeys ago, I thought, okay, I've done all the A-list, let's do the b So in the last four journeys, four or five journeys to India, I did all of the almost all of the B and the C list ones, too. I in the last two years, I spent another six, seven months in India driving everywhere. Very interesting place to drive. And now I um, have been to almost all of those. And I have a friend in India. His name is Rana Singh. He's a professor there. And one time. Uh, each time I go back to Northern India, I go see Rana. And the last two times I've said, Rana, well, so, cause Rana knows Hindu, Hindu, only Hindu. He doesn't know Buddhist Jain. He just knows Hindu. And I said, Rana, who knows Hindu pilgrimage sites outside of you the best? And I thought he would say this guy named Alan Marinus, who got a Rhodes scholarship or a woman named Diana Eck, who is a professor of cultural history in Harvard. And he said, undoubtedly you, He said, you've been to more of these sites than both of them put together. Then we had a few more drinks. He likes good scotch. We had a few more drinks. And he said, Martin, it's embarrassing for me to say this. You've been to more Indian pilgrimage sites even than I have. He says, you're without a doubt the leading scholar of pilgrimages in the the Hindu tradition. But he only knows Hinduism. I know Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, all of them for India. So I'm not boasting. I'm just stating the fact. There's no human being, no human being ever 
that has known Indian pilgrimage tradition as well as me. And I can say the same thing about Japan and Bolivia and France, all of them, all mm. of them. It's the only thing I know, but I know it very, very well. Yeah, no, I can I can hear that in an in intensity to the path of your life that you had this vision early on and you've <laughs> stayed with it. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's uh, having visited so many places and um, how should I say this? Um, you know, Americans, we have a, a reputation around the world of maybe being uh, inconsiderate tourists, to, to, to put it one way. Um, do you have any tips for travelers about how to respectfully engage with these sacred sites if you're going to it? Whether, you know, you said earlier there's people that are going as spiritual uh, pilgrims, but also people who just saw it in a guidebook and said, oh, I should go to Chichen Itza or something like that. So yeah, do you have any tips about how to engage with these places with respect? Definitely have that. But first of all, I would like to say that American travelers are loved. Americans are so, so popular. Everywhere you go in the world, people they love America for a number of reasons. They love America because a lot of times they have relatives that work over, let's say, in a pizzeria in Chicago and they send money back to Botswana. Or they love rock music and they love Apple and they love Amazon and they love Netflix. So people love America for that. Then Americans are such friendly people. So they love American travelers. Sometimes Americans are a bit pushy. They talk a bit loud like me. I'm not pushy, but I talk loud. But everywhere I go, people love Americans. Sometimes they don't like the political administration. They don't like that. They don't like America causing war in Afghanistan and Iraq, two places I've been. But it's really amazing. I was in Iraq last year for three weeks and I was able to do Iraq sacred sites in great detail. And at first, you know, people never know you're from America unless you tell them or you show your passport. We're just white people. But when I told people in Iraq and I was there for three weeks going all over, when I told them I was from Iraq, they were so happy. They loved me. Everybody was so friendly to me. So that that's really important to know that as an American, you can travel everywhere and people like you, even in Russia, wherever they like Americans. So, out, that, OK, well, when they get to know you, they like you, you know, I think. But I, I you know, I, I've not traveled as much as you, but in my, you know, tr traveling around, I just noticed that sometimes Americans, um, yeah, there's an, there's a bit of an entitlement and, and a bit of like, oh, definitely. A, 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 you know, yeah. a demanding that things need to yeah. be their way right away, yeah. you know, when it comes yeah. to, yeah. uh, and there's a lot of, you know, colonialism, there's a lot of reasons for that, but, yep. Yep. um, yep. Yep. so yeah, my question, I don't have an entitlement thing anymore, though. I'm sad to say there's been a few times, let's say I'm in Africa, I'm down in some country in Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia or something, and I don't speak the local language. I'm having a little trouble. OK, there's some entitlement. I know that I can go to a large hotel and just walk inside of the hotel. And because my white skin, I can just go in and they're going to be nice to me. I know. And so there is some entitlement. But generally, I don't have that. So how to be at the sacred sites? What I say is, first of all, come with respect. Come with respect. That That's so important. You don't own the place. And whether you're an American or a Japanese or a French, when you're in another country, Always, always, always have respect. Um, when you're at a site, I don't, if you want to do some ritual, which is probably not going to be their ritual, but if you want to do whatever ritual you have, you know, you bring out your crystals, whatever you want to do, okay, do that if you wish, but you don't need to. All you really need to do is be there. It's like, let's say it's really cold outside and you see a building and you know it's going to be warm inside. You go inside the building. You don't have to do anything to be warm, right? You just go inside. And the same thing when you're at one of these power places, you don't have to do anything there. It's when you like if you have a wearing blender and you want your wearing blender to turn on or your lamp to turn on, all you got to do is plug it into the wall. And the same thing with the sacred site. Just go. You are plugged in. That's it. And if you have an intention, that predisposes you somewhat to a deeper connection, but really – the power of these places is so strong. Just go. All you got to do is be there. And then people say, what to do when you're there? And I go, well, it's sometimes it's nice if you can take a nap. And in medi big medieval pilgrimage cathedrals, they got all these pews. You just lie down on, the, on it. And at a lot of places like Mayan tombs and Indian temples, if I can, I lie down and take a nap. And then I always try to do a meditation. And it really doesn't even matter what type of meditation you're doing. Again, it's just be there. 
you know, like Ram Dass used to say, be here now. Just be here now. That's it. Just be there. That's it. And the neat thing also is you don't have to be there that long because, you know, if you download something on your computer, they're really quick. You can do megabytes at once. Same thing. You go to the site, you're plugged in. You don't have to stay eight months. You don't have to stay eight days. Just go there. The connection occurs. And then understand this is super important. The connection goes both ways. We function as acupuncture needles into the earth. We function at doing planetary acupuncture. Even if you don't understand it or don't even know it, you're there at a site and you're having an energetic effect upon the site. And then the site is having an effect upon you. All you, ne- all you need to do is be there. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think that ties back to what we were both saying earlier about the energy existing before the people came and then the people coming to these sites, adding to that energy. So you get this kind of flow that you're reinforcing at every, every single person who comes there is... A, a drop in that ocean of, of current of, yeah. the, of that power yeah. site. And it's cumulative. Yeah. Think of it. You have some of these places. There are sacred sites, pilgrimage sites in India that 10, 20, 30,000 people a day, a day go to. And so when you go into one of these places that gets 5 million people a year, and it's been doing that for hundreds or thousands of years, the energy in there is so palpable, so strong. Whoa. And so people say, well, why do you do this? And I say to people, this, this one took me about, this one took me maybe 20 years to get, but there's only two things happening at the sacred sites. Only two. People are saying please and thank you. That's it. They're praying for something. They're saying, oh, Lord, my daughter is, we, help her graduate from high school. Or my grandfather has, you know, he's not feeling so well, so help him get better. So they're praying for something or they're coming back and saying, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for granting that prayer. So people go, well, why do you go to these places? Well, the, 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 the most, the places on planet earth with the most intense feeling of love, you know, more than a mother bringing up her kid, because then the kid is brought up and the kid is grown and they don't live at home anymore. But if you go to these sacred sites where hundreds and hundreds of millions of people have gone and they're plugging into that field of love. They're amplifying it themselves. Oh, that's why I go do what I do. And I just happen to take pictures along the way. But basically, I just like going to be in these wonderful, wonderful holy places. Mm, that's lovely. And uh, so it's it's photos is your is your main um, medium. So, but um, I'm curious too because I've the few sacred sites I've been to. Um, I'm, I'm always drawn by the soundscapes of the places. Have, mm. have you done any kind of uh, field recording or vi- video recording no, capturing? No. no. Uh, but now back to what something you just said, and I'd like to hear the sacred sites that you've gone to. But you said something about f- photography. This one took me a while to get. Also, to me now, and somebody could, an Orthodox archaeologist could go, "This guy's crazy," but. I consider that my photographs are actually windows. And I consider that the visual homeopathic essence of the site is transmitted through the window. And if you know about homeopathy, they'll often say the slighter the application, the greater the response. And the most powerful homeopathic remedies are actually the ones that were prepared radionically where there was none of the essence actually touching the medium in which it's carried in. So if you think about a sacred site that hundreds of millions of people have gone to, so it's got this powerful energy. And then I take a picture of it. And as I'm taking a picture of it, I'm making a prayer. A lot of times I'm composing my image with my camera and I'm saying to the site, I talk to the sites and I'm going, hey, here we are in Swaziland, for example. And I'm talking to the site and I'm saying, chances are not too many people from Cincinnati or Minneapolis are going to be here. But please, oh, the spirit of the site, help me in the composition and construction of this image such that when someone is looking at this photograph years later in Cincinnati, there's that they're looking through a window. And so something comes through it. Definitely something comes through it. But now back to the sound thing. I've been asked that before. And no, I hear the chanting. I I hear the music that is played in these sites. But it's not been my... um, my, 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 my service, my assignment to do anything with that. I am entranced, entranced when I get to be at these places 
and there's music being played or there's chanting that is being done. I really like that. But that's not been my service. I think other people have that particular service and have been doing that, but not me. Yeah. No, and, and the way you describe your photos as these portals to it, it, it reminds me of the story you opened uh, our conversation with about having this vision of yourself as an older older person doing this work, and the fact that these many of these sacred sites are windows into antiquity, windows into deep time, and the collapsing of space time into this yeah. non non linear space where there's not a yeah. present and future that you know. You're you're here, and you're here with the ancestors, and you're here. You are an yeah. ancestor yourself to what's going to be coming down the road. And see, that's really fascinating what you say there too, because you are speaking of things of which my experience is sometimes little. So I'm not saying I'm an expert on all facets of what's going on in the pilgrimage places. No, no, no. I feel like somebody asked me the other day something, and I went, "No, I can't talk about that. I'm not that sensitive." I'm not that sensitive. Other people report things that happens at sacred sites that I go, wow, that's fantastic. What I am is sort of an archivist. And I'm a, I'm a lover of the sacred sites. And I, <laughs> this is funny. Sometimes I feel that maybe there's a, a, a great spirit of God of all the sacred sites. And at one time communicated to all these sacred sites. And it says there's this strange American guy that's going to come around one day, maybe 10, 15 years. He's going to take your picture. Look good that day. That day look really good because then he's going to share his pictures with other people and other people who have different sensitivity qualities and depths will come and will do other things and learn other things but they will know about the places because this guy martin gray came and took their pretty picture but i'm not an i great i know a great deal about archaeology history and mythology i know that now and i'm pretty good at pointing the black fox the camera but i'm not an expert on the energy of these sites there's a lot of things and you brought up the sound thing and i go i don't know about that i don't know about that that's not my specialty and here's an excerpt of a recording that i made in shwedagon pagoda in yangon myanmar in 2018 one of the sacred sites listed on martin's site And I, and I imagine too, with these photos, obviously you're you're trying to encourage people to come come to these sites and spread the word on them. But is is there a part of you that wants to balance the preservation of these sites and not making them overly commercial? And you know, you you mentioned earlier that the, the please and thank you are are the primary things you hear at the site. And I guess the cynical part of my mind was like, yeah, what about all the people like selling trinkets and harassing you and trying to get you to buy stuff at the... Uh... Oh, I love that too. Okay. I mean, <laughs> oh, I mean, on my desk right here. Okay, so here we have outside at pilgrimage shrines everywhere, there's these little markets around the shrine. And so here is, this is from Southern India. Here we have Sadaswati, one of my favorite goddesses. And then, oh, and then here there is a, a Chaitanya. And Chaitanya is one of my favorite deities. He's not a deity. He was a devotee of Krishna. And then I was just in Taiwan. And this is Mazu, the goddess of the ocean. And so I love these. And if you came and saw my place, you'd go, Martin, you have a lot of these little deity statues. Well, why? These are so cool because... You know, in Hinduism, this is a really fascinating thing to know. In Hinduism, this is not a statue. This is this is Hanuman. 
in Hinduism. They consider this is Saraswati because when these statues, these deities are made, then they undergo consecration rituals and where the deity comes in, inhabits, lives in the, the statue. So when you go into the market where I bought this one, there were hundreds of little statues of Saraswati. And so you buy one of these and then you bring it home and then Saraswati is living in your house. So I love those 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 markets. I love them and I interact so much with the people in them. I, I got to tell you, man, I love them, whether it's Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Islamic, Jain, all of them have those markets. And I just love those. And nobody ever hassles me. And if somebody does hassle me, I reframe it and I have a nice conversation with them. And if somebody wants a little bit of money, I give to beggars so often. I give so much money to beggars. Because I have more money than they do, so I don't, I don't mind people hassling me. I, I am treated so well at these sacred sites. And okay, I remember when I first went to Tulum. It's, it's, it's a sacred site to Ikshel, a Mayan goddess. And when I went to the first time to Tulum, this is like basically maybe in 85, and I was on my bicycle, and there was no barbed wire, no fences at Tulum. There were no buildings anywhere, nothing. And down the road, now you have to – now there's condos there and the Mexican government and all this stuff, but there was nothing. And now there's more. And But still the power of place is there. And yeah, when you stand up on the – the, the pyramid and you look down the beach, oh, there's some condos being built. It's just going to happen. Nothing we can do about it. Going to happen. But this other thing, man, I want people at the sites. And already, you know, you look at some of these medieval pilgrimage cathedrals. Wow, there's so many visitors. And you look at these ones in India, they get really tens of millions of people a year. Great. Great. They're already so commercialized. They're already so built up and, and developed. And so the infrastructure of support is there. The infrastructure is support is there. And if it isn't, and then the government of that country or the local or regional government sees, oh, wow, if we build a few buildings here, we could house tourists and then the trinket sellers come, then the local people are making some money. Mm -hmm. I don't have any problem with that. I want more people coming to these places. Okay. So you've never, uh, you don't know of a sacred site that was basically ruined by over tourism. Well, you could say, you could say now, and I contribute to this and people have said, because I'm sort of the leading UNESCO photographer of sacred sites. Now, before UNESCO world heritage sites, n nobody really in the world had heard much of Angkor Wat in Cambodia or Machu Picchu, some of these sites. And now they become UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And so many people go. And especially at Machu Picchu, the site can get overwhelmed. So the Peruvian government is limiting the number of people that come can come into the site. And with that, I agree. I agree because the sites can be overwhelmed with too many people, but still I want the people to go. I want the people to be in that, that, you know, there's a density of holiness that saturates and surrounds these places. I want people to be in that field. And yeah, I, I do that. And if it's a conundrum, it's a definitely a conundrum that maybe a site is too visited. I get that. I get that. But I feel something is happening on this planet that there's a net gain. You know, I was saying to someone the other day that I feel that we're at the beginning of a Gaian age of pilgrimage and pilgrimage sites have a power that is essential to the awakening of consciousness on this planet. So I, I want people to go because I look at my you know, I travel a lot. So my carbon footprint is high, let's say. And if people go to these sites, the carbon footprint is high. But I think there's a net gain. It's better to have, because of pilgrimage, a little bit higher carbon footprint because what people are getting from these sites is immeasurably more important. Yeah. And as you said earlier, giving to the site and hopefully taking that energy with them to become uh, a, a force for, you know, a force for good in their own lives yeah, and yeah. the lives of yeah. others. 
And cool what you just said, hopefully taking some with you. Now, yeah. what's really interesting thing about that is the energy is cumulative. So yeah. somebody may go to 10 or 15 sites just because they're on tours and they're going to places for monumental architecture. And then they have an awakening. Right. Then something starts to happen because the energy builds up in you. Mm -hmm. And so even when you go to a site and you don't know this has happened, you still become a radiant source point of the energy of the site because it has touched you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and you you've carry it with you, you know, forever. Mm -hmm. You're a different. You're a different person before and after you go to these sites. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I love it when there's lots of my gosh, the great festivals. They're so. I was just. I in the last three months, I was back in India. I was in India, Philippines, Taiwan, and Japan. And when I can, I try to go be at the pilgrimage sites during the festivals but sometimes i can't but when i can okay sometimes wow it's like there's a hundred thousand people here today it's there's it's really crowded mm -hmm. but i love it yeah i love it like you gotta keep your uh, kumbh, kumbh kumbh mela. yeah yeah i've done that one three times mm -hmm. that's great yeah and have oh you and the le legend of kumbh mela is so very interesting Legends and myths are so important. Like a lot of Orthodox scholars will say, oh, it's just, you know, imaginations of preliterate people. They, we, it's not important. To me, the legends and the myths, sometimes they're a window onto the real meaning of the site. Mm. They're incredibly important, but you got to know how to read the myth. Okay. Have you seen uh, Shortcut to Nirvana, the documentary about the no. Kumbh? Okay. No. Because it's such a different world. I mean, it's literally like coming to another planet compared to Los Angeles. I think out of date. Out of date. Now, reason, is my main sort of effort is uh, to promote religious harmony. From the trailer of Shortcut to Nirvana by Maurizio Benazzo and Nick Day. We will have a link to find out more about this film in the show notes. Now, back to our conversation. Here, you're talking about Kumba. So another legend that's really incredible in India. Not too many people know this, but you've got your Shiva shrines. Okay, so here's a little Shiva. Well, Shiva had a wife. First a girlfriend and a wife, Shakti. Well, Shakti's father doesn't like Shiva because Shiva causes trouble. He's always busting things up. So one day Shakti's father is going to have a party, but he doesn't invite Shiva. So Shiva, Sh Shakti goes to the party. And then she gets in an argument with her dad, and then she dies. Shiva is really upset. So he comes to the party, and he starts destroying everything, and he's destroying the universe. So everybody gets really upset. My gosh, Shiva's going to destroy the universe. So they ask Vishnu to help. So what Vishnu does is he comes, and he says, well, we got to stop this. So Vishnu, he's got this discus, this round thing like this, and he throws it at Shakti's body, and it cuts her body into 54 different pieces. And where these 54 different pieces fall to earth are what are called Shakti Pithas. <clears throat> and when an Indian woman has an ailment in a particular part of her body, she will go to the Shakti Pitha shrine that corresponds with that particular part of her body. So at this point, I've gone to maybe 30 of those Shakti Pitha shrines. Men can go, but they're mostly women. Now, you could somebody could say, oh, that's just ridiculous. That's impossible. And I'd go, maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe there is something about certain places that has an effect upon different parts of women's bodies. I would not just disregard the myth. I'd read into it more. I'd go keeping my mind open. Yep. Yeah, well, this this openness and, and um, 
I think this need for ancient wisdom is is so crucial right now, you know, with, with environmental collapse and things of that nature. So just dismiss these uh, these time honored things that have worked for tens of thousands of years, you know, going bathing in the Ganga, you know, to heal yourself. Like mm -hmm. how can, how can you say that doesn't work? People have been doing like probably mm -hmm. millions of people have done it. So, Oh, many hundreds of millions in the Ganges. Hundreds. Yeah. I've done it. Yeah. yeah I, Drinking the water. I don't know, but I've bathed in the Ganges a number of times. Yeah. yeah. On the news tonight, they say there's a meteor coming towards the earth. It'll be here in seven days. It's possible Mass, mass extinction event, where would you go? Well, you know, that's interesting you bring that up because there was a time when people would ask me questions of if I retired, where would I go? And um, I used to say, well, I'm going to stay in the cities to try to bring goodness and love to the people. I'm going to use my voice and try to communicate. Um, now, if I knew that life was going to be exterminated in seven days, I would probably just hang out wherever I was and just do Vipassana and just really try to plug into divine spirit and and just be there um, just wherever I was. If someone were to say, OK, and I get asked this question, this guy that interviewed me this morning from Dublin, he said, what are the five? What are your five major sacred sites? And I go, no such thing. No such thing, because a site that may be important for me may not be important for someone else. So I said, he said, well, how do you know? And I, I said, well, get a book, get one of my books. And, you know, like how you consult the I Ching as an oracle. I said, have an intention in your mind saying, oh, great spirit. Oh, spirit of the earth. Where would be a good place for me to go and shut your eyes and do that and then just stop? And maybe, according to the power of your intention, maybe you'll stop on a place that would be good for you to go. Now, I can talk about certain places that I deeply love, um, but I can't say what is best for anyone else. No, I just would say go to these places and trust your own intuition and trust divinity acting through oracles like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I was trying to... Uh, make a clever way of asking what's your favorite sacred site? <laughs> like, you know, okay, okay we're, we're all doomed. I'm going to go to here. Just cause that's, okay, cause that's good. Maybe, well, basically like, have you ever been to a site where you said, okay, this is the place if my, if I'm dying or if I need something or like, this is the place I need to go to in my time. of Yeah. I would probably say, um, there's two that just really, 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 really grabbed me. The one that I was the place I first traveled on my own. The very first journey on my own was the Golden Temple in Amritsar in, 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 in Punjab in India. Uh, stunningly. You been there? No, I've never been in Punjab. No. Oh, what, what a great place. And everything's free. Incredible. I love the Golden Temple very, very much. And then there is a sacred site in Japan um, named Miyajima. Miyajima Island. And I've been to Miyajima Island four times now. There's a mountain called Misensan, 1739 meters tall. And I just love Miyajima. I love, you see, there it is, Japan and India, the two countries I, I know best. It wouldn't be in America. America is not a place that I feel much resonance with. Um, um, there's a number of places in Europe, but I feel such a resonance with India and Japan. So it would, it would, it would probably be those two. Yeah. 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 Probably be those two, but I got so many, Oh, there's so many I love. <laughs> nice. Cool. And, um, so what's, what's up next for you? Are you going to more sites this year mm -hmm. to photograph? Well, that's interesting you ask that because there's sort of two major projects in my life. One was to visit and chronicle these pilgrimage sites all over the world. The other one is something that I call my big view project, and it's intimately related to the sacred sites. And the big view project was for me that I need to go I want to, need to go, should go to every region of the world and look from it, not just be at it, but look from it. And so at this point, I've done every region of the world except two areas in Africa. In three or four weeks, I'm going to go back to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Finland, 
mainly to hang out while I'm waiting to go into Africa. And then in October, beginning of uh, middle of the first week in October, I'm going to go in and I'm going to be about six months in 15 different countries of Western Africa. And then Next year, around the same time, I'm going to go do about 10 countries in more central Africa, and then I will have finished the world. And then maybe, maybe, I maybe <laughs> I will start the next phase of what I might do, of what the visions since I was six indicated that I ought to do, I should do, which is – and some people might go, Martin, that's megalomaniacal, that's narcissistic. And I go, I agree with you. It sounds that, but maybe it's not. Because if you study politics in political theory, one of the things it's important to do is to be trusted by your constituency. And one of the things that make your constituency trust you is if you've been to where they're from. And so right now, except I, I can't talk about Cameroon because I haven't been there. But 160 other countries I have been. So within another couple of years, I will have been to 185 countries such that if I were to somehow, and I'm not sure how this would happen, though I have got a lot of interesting ideas about that, which would be the subject of a very, very, very good interview on that. But I, in a sense, can speak for a lot of people in the world because I have been to where they're from. I know this planet very, 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 very well. So I've got this trip coming up, which is basically a lazy thing in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. But then it's hardcore work. I don't have any more sacred sites to do. Last year with Iraq and this year with Taiwan, I finished that finish that. Now it's doing two more big journeys for my big view project. And then I'll be a bit over 70 and I'll have some more gray hair. And, you know, if, if God, uh, God says, okay, now be a playtex living glove on the hand of God this way, then I'll do it. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. Well, I'm sure there'll be new sacred sites popping up at some point, hopefully. Inshallah. Inshallah. Yeah. If God wills. I yes. see. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this uh, uh, audio journey of your travels. And we'll have links to your website so people can look at all of your marvelous photos and view the sacred site atlas that you've created. Um, so yeah, it's been a real pleasure, Martin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful communication. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for listening to The Sounds of Sand. We invite you to explore more of our talks, dialogues, videos, articles, events, and offerings through our website, scienceandnonduality.com. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please consider becoming a member to access our massive library of SAND content, available exclusively to SAND members. And we would love it if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, and Spotify and share this episode with your family, friends, and all sentient beings. Be well.